Um, we're very pleased to bring you a gentleman this afternoon who has a very well-known family name. He is a native Rochester resident, uh, a graduate of Central Michigan with a Bachelor of Art degree, and he's a businessman who spent his entire career in the retail automotive business. He's the current president of the Oaks Chapter, that's Oakland Township, of the Sons of the American Revolution, and he is a proud grandfather who likes to spend time with his granddaughter. Please welcome John Christmas. Thank you, Margaret, and, and thank you to the Society for inviting me to be here today, and thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm enlisting my friend Jim Hopkins here to uh, help me push the button to advance these slides. This, well, I'll walk over and show you. This, this, is the, uh, this is the very first time I've ever done a PowerPoint, and so a lot of people look at me like, you're going to do this for the first time in front of a crowd of people? I said, yeah, you might as well, you know, make a fool out of yourself in front of a lot of people. So it's, it's hopefully will go okay. Uh, without, without two daughters, I wouldn't have had a PowerPoint at all. So I'm glad to see that uh, all that tuition I paid over the years, maybe I'm getting some benefit from it, finally. So at any rate, uh, you know, when thinking about this, I, I'm going to be focusing quite a bit on, on the businesses uh, that the family's been involved in over the years. Uh, because actually, just showing up to a town and never leaving really doesn't warrant this kind of attention. <laughs> so, just because we we, you know, we don't we didn't move around much except for this one time uh, is probably nothing to brag about, but it does make for a long history in one area. And like all stories, it has a beginning. In the beginning, in this story is uh, 1833 in May, so it should be 183 years this coming May, that uh, Benjamin Chrisman, who lived in a little town called Blairstown, New Jersey, which is in kind of central New Jersey, for some reason that I have not been able to discover, was motivated to pack up his family of seven children and uh, move, move, to, move to Michigan. And when you study your family history, as many of you have, it's always interesting because you'll see that there's a relationship between your family history and the greater history. And I think what prompted part of this was the Erie Canal, which opened in 1825. In 1825, suddenly the Erie Canal opened, and now you can get all the way across New York to the Great Lakes without a horse and wagon, and that's what they did. So there were two other families in Blairstown, the Snobners, who I've never heard of since, <laughs> and the Youngs. And these three families got together and somehow collectively decided that moving to Michigan would be a good idea. Again, I don't know what the motivation was, but uh, Benjamin Christman put his farm up for sale and sold it fairly quickly for $1,000. And legend has it that he was paid in silver dollars. So I thought about that for a while, and I thought, gee, you know, how do you carry a thousand silver dollars around? But whatever, he, that's how he got paid. And, and so in May, the, the three families, which really uh, encompassed 33 people, uh, first they had to go east to go west. So what they did was they took horses and wagons and went east to a place called Northport, New York, I'm sorry, New Jersey, which is just opposite Manhattan on the Hudson River. And uh, from there they took a boat north to Albany, and from there they got on the Erie Canal, which must have been quite an adventure because, you know, these things were just big barges towed by horses or mules, and uh, they traveled 363 miles on the canal and went through 35 locks, and they managed to pull this trip off in three weeks, which I find hard to believe that you could cover at that pace. But that's that's what the book says, so I, I have to take it, take them at their word. 
Benjamin was married to a woman named Mary Kern. Benjamin himself was born in 1781, and he married Mary Kern in 1812, and he was a tailor by trade back in Blairstown, uh, and also a farmer. He had seven children, six boys and one girl, and they were Henry, John, Susanna, Amos, Charles, David, and Michael. And uh, just to jump ahead here a little bit, it's amazing how fast a family expands. Uh, they were the first Christmas to, to be in, in Michigan, as far as I know, at least in this area. And uh, those seven children collectively had 50 children between them. <laughs> so you can see the family rapidly expanded. And uh, so you had all these different branches that settled in different towns around Michigan, and we'll go through that in a couple of minutes. Uh, my branch of the family was Charles, and he was born in 1820, and they were all kids when they came here and uh, as a family. Can you click the slide there for me? The you didn't tell me the button yet. I'm telling you. Oh, the button, I don't want to blow it up. Uh, the, uh, one of those. <laughs> the down button. And it's on you. The down button? Try the down button. The down button. There, you go. there we go. There's the Erie Canal. Thank you. So this isn't a great picture, but it gives you an idea of the route that they took from, from, from Blair's. I actually got a lot of maps out and tried to trace this journey. And uh, while I just gave it to you verbally, it was just too tough to get a map of New Jersey because roads change names, and I can't give you the exact route, except for it was quite a, quite a journey. Uh, from Buffalo, they, when they went to Buffalo at the end of the Erie Canal, they ended up in Buffalo, and from there they took a steamer boat to Detroit. Then they had horses and wagons and traveled north to Rochester. And the reason they came to Rochester was one of the Snobner families had come to Rochester the previous year and had a place out here someplace. And they traveled five miles north to the Axford farm. So most of you probably, I'm assuming it's the same Axford farm that... that it is. Pardon me? It is. It is. So, I mean, that, that's where they all landed, all 33 of them after three weeks. The problem became, and this one snobber guy, this guy was supposed to have a place for everybody to stay temporarily. Only when they got there, he'd forgotten about the Christmas. So there was no place for the Christmas to stay. So Benjamin Christman retained the horses and wagons and Teamsters and said, well, we might as well keep going. And I don't know why, but he went a little northeast to Washington Township. And when he got to Washington Township, he found a, a farm for sale, and it was, he bought a farm from a uh, fellow by the name of Benjamin Tubbs. Can you move the yeah. button? Can you pull that over towards you so you don't have to? Well, I don't know how far that cord will allow, but take it as far we'll as you with, can. Take it to the limit. Take it to the limit. No, we're, we need to move. To the <laughs> That's okay, but we need to go to the next slide. Okay. Okay, uh, this I have to thank Debbie Larson for, because I didn't know where they went exactly. And Debbie, being the Cracker Jack researcher that she is, found it. This is a Washington Township land map of 1859, but it still shows Benjamin Christman's land holdings. I don't know if you can read them or not, but they're right in here. Part of the farm... Well, there was no house at that point, but there was a barn. So they actually lived in a barn for several months until uh, they could build a house. And also on the property was a business, and the name of the business was the Buckhorn Tavern. Now, I had always heard about the Buckhorn Tavern, but I never knew where it was. So I asked Debbie, can you have any idea where this Buckhorn Tavern was? And she came up with it again, and it, is, it was on the corner of 28 Mile and Mound Road, 
only I'm not sure which corner yet. So we're still working on that. But the Buckhorn Tavern was an interesting place. As near as I can figure out, it was a combination general store and bar. And uh, it had a, a big set of antlers on the sign, and that's how everybody knew what it was. And Benjamin, so Benjamin became a businessman. It was really the very, very first business that Christman family owned in Michigan. And he sold, uh, he had a little book, and he recorded everything in this book, all his transactions. He called it his day book. This day book still exists. Some descendant has it. But uh, in it, he recorded, like, you know, selling grains and different things like that. And he also sold whiskey. And I have a funny feeling from reading these excerpts that I could get that uh, Benjamin was a little bit of a Shylock in that he wasn't afraid to charge liberal amounts of interest. He sold things on credit. <laughs> and there is a case in there where he sold a gallon of whiskey to a guy for 25 cents on credit. And the guy took so long paying him that he ended up paying him more than three dollars when it was <laughs> <laughs> so. I, I, I'm sure Benjamin declared that on his income tax, but I, I, I don't know. So he made he, that's how he made his living: uh, combination farming and running the Buckhorn Tavern. So, if you can push the slide again, please. All right, that's Benjamin Christman's home in 1852. That is not Benjamin Christman standing there. I, I could not find a picture of Benjamin Christman anywhere. But just to the left where you see that pile of stuff, uh, that's the little tiny bit of a corner of the Buckhorn Tavern. So you can see he lived right next door to his business. <coughs> the person in the picture there is actually one of the sons, Michael, and his family. Although Benjamin Christman was still around then. <coughs> Is the house still there? No. I don't know what happened to the house. So, at any rate, as I said, Benjamin had seven sons, one daughter. Can you push the button, please? And, and there, there are the six sons. Now, if I can get this right, standing left to right is Charles, in the middle David, on the right Michael, then sitting is Henry, in the middle is John, and on the right is Amos. And this picture was taken in 1872. The purpose of the picture was Michael and David, who were the oldest and the youngest, shared the same birthday 14 years apart. Mm. So they had a big birthday party. And for that occasion, they, they brought in a professional photographer to take the picture, and Susanna, their sister, was supposed to be in the picture, but being a woman, she got the date mixed up. Showed up two days. I'm just kidding. So showed up two days late and missed the picture. So you you often see her referred to in other in family history. They called her the late Susanna. She evidently never lived that down. And uh, this, this picture, even even though it's a picture taken in 1872, was often used to announce reunions, which we'll talk about in a couple of minutes. But uh, they would have these epic reunions up until the 1950s, right here. And you can see Avon Township Park. And I, th I thought it was rather interesting that uh, they say on there, don't forget to bring your own sugar. Oh, and that, that has to be as, re you know, the war had ended, but just, just ended. And so I assume there was still a shortage of commodities out there. And so if you wanted sugar, you had to bring your own. So. If you want to click. Ready. Thank you. There's Charles Crispin a few years later. Uh, I don't know how old he was in the previous picture where you saw him standing. He was 52 years old. Uh, in this picture, I have no idea how old he is. Obviously, he's elderly. He died in uh, 1902, so he lived to be 82. Uh, his father, Benjamin Christman, died in, in 1861, about two months after the Civil War started. So the family scattered, you know, the, the original core family scattered over a period of time, and Benjamin 
Charles, not Benjamin, I'm sorry, Charles, John, and Michael inherited the, the Benjamin Crispin farm. By then it expanded quite a bit. And so they all stayed in the Washington Township area. Uh, one of them moved to Plainfield, one of them moved to Grand Rapids, and uh, like one moved to Romeo. There was Romeo, Oxford, Utica, I mean, that's, they ended up spreading out all over the place. And they all had large families too, so there were a lot of Christmans in the area. But Charles Christman was really the branch that I descend from, so that's what I've got the information on. And uh, so the next generation would be his son, Harvey Christman. Harvey came from a family, Charles had eight children, Harvey being one of them. You want to push the button, please? And this was Harvey's home. Now, this home does still stand. It's on the corner of Sheldon Road and Snell Road. And it, it was referred to for many years as the Christman Orchards. And Harvey, that was the second business. And Harvey ran an orchard. And uh, he, the, the legend has it, he married a woman named Carrie Mae Albertson. And Carrie Mae came from a prosperous family. Her father was named Eli Albertson. He was a very prosperous guy. He had three daughters. And family legend has it that each one of his daughters was given a farm by him. And this was, this was the farm that, that Carrie Mae inherited. And of course, Harvey married into. So Harvey, Harvey married into this business, but ran it for, for many, many years. And they, they raised peaches and apples on this farm and uh, took them to market. And you click the button, please. Well, I got that out of order. This is Harvey's family. You want me to no, that's right. This one? is Harvey's family. And Harvey is the older guy with the mustache. Way to the right, in the right corner there, is Ward Christman, one of his sons. Right next to Harvey, just to Harvey's right, is Clayton Christman, another son. And way to the left, kind of cut out of the picture, is Louis Christman, who is my grandfather. And then the cousins are down there, and unfortunately one of the cousins got cut out of this picture. We seem to be good at leaving one person out of every picture. <laughs> and, and right next to the young lady is Arlene, and she was Ward's daughter. And that's another story. And then there was Keith, who some of you may remember, and my dad, Kenneth, who some of you may remember also. And that was the entire family. They were a very, very close-knit family. Even though they were cousins, I think that there were only four in the siblings, and they, uh, they, they always were very, very close. This picture was taken at the farmhouse on, on Sheldon Road, and I believe the occasion was the 50th anniversary of Harvey and Carrie May. You can click it again. Yeah. That's what I thought I was going to get. Um, the fellow that owned the farm up till just a few years ago was a guy by the name of Dr. Grant and his wife. They were very nice. They happened to be customers of mine. And I got to know him, and every now and then, uh, Dr. Grant would dig something up, literally, uh, or find it in a barn there, and, and he gave it to me. So I have a few relics from the orchards, and this being one of them, and this is from their Eastern Market license, obviously. It's a metal sign, and uh, it survived quite well. Uh, does anybody notice the typo in this, though? The orcs? No, Rochester. Rochester. They left the H out of Rochester. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, I had that sign for quite a while before I noticed it. <laughs> uh, they also sold uh, the fruit down at the building on the corner of University in Maine. I don't know exactly where, but whether they sold it out of the drugstore or had a little annex store or something, but I'll show you in a minute an ad where it says you can buy it there too, down right in downtown Rochester. Uh, as far as I know, the orchard did quite well. Uh, 
at least it provided them with a, a good living. And uh, eventually that, that orchard was taken over by Clayton, one of the three brothers, uh, when Harvey got too old to do it himself. You can go on to the next slide if you will, please. Okay, this picture is, is of what I call the Christman brothers, Clayton, Ward, and Lewis. And I, I really love this picture. And I don't know how, what year it was taken. I mean, these guys were born in 1888, 1889, and 1890. So I can't tell how old they are there. But if you do the math, it's got to be the early 1900s because they were just kids. What I like about this picture is it, it's a snapshot. And you just don't see that many snapshots from that era. I mean, everything was kind of a formal posed picture back then. And this was just like capturing a moment in time. And this picture hung in my grandmother's house on 4th Street all the time I was growing up, one particular spot. And I always loved that picture. In, in 1958, my grandmother, my grandfather died by then. My grandmother remarried Art Gilman. And uh, that's another whole story. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, moved out of the house in the arts house up on North Main Street, and she gave me the picture. Okay. And so the, a few years later, when I first got out of college, I moved back into that house. My, it was still in the family. I moved into that house, and I rehung the picture <laughs> in exactly the same spot, and it hung there for another 11 years. So when I finally moved out of the house, I brought the picture with me, and it hangs in my present house now. But... Uh, I just thought those guys looked happy and, and uh, kind of delighted and looked like they were having a good time. So it, it's always been a, a great family treasure that I managed to swing with. So. <laughs> anyway, these were the three guys who kind of like started a lot of the businesses that we're going to be talking about, or at least were the roots of the businesses that we're going to talk about. Now, particularly my grandfather, Louis, uh, was quite a quite a hustler in his day, and uh, was involved in, in in many different enterprises. Uh, you can click the picture, please. All these ads come from about the same era. I'm not sure they come from the exact same year, but they come from the same era. And if you can see, there's the orchards, and if you. Well, you can read it down there, but there's something that says about it's available also downtown at the corner of University of Maine. Now, Clayton, before he went to work at the Orchards, was a partner with Lewis in the drugstore. I don't know whether Clayton was a pharmacist or not, Lewis was, or whether he was just a business partner. Uh, you can see the prices that were pretty reasonable uh, back then. And then, Everybody says, Burr Hardware, what's that got to do with anything? Well, we were involved with Burr Hardware, too. And uh, I have lunch uh, once a month with Rob Robertson, whose grandfather was Ward Christman, so we're second cousins. What happened was George Burr, who started his hardware store in downtown Rochester. You can click the button. And there it is. In 1914, and he was uh, again another fairly prosperous businessman. He had one daughter named Neva, and Ward Christman married Neva, and they in turn had one daughter. So it was a very very small family. Neva, uh, that was Arlene, and they were pictured in that picture on the porch I was taking. And so, about 1920, George Burr retired or officially retired, and turned the uh, business over to his son-in-law, who was Ward Christman. Mm -hmm. So if you noticed on that little advertisement back there, it says Ward Christman proprietor. Now, Ward Christman probably would have stayed there his entire, well, he did stay there his entire life. Unfortunately, it ended suddenly in 1934, when he was struck with appendicitis. And back then, if your appendix burst, it was it. Uh, it, it was a different day and age, and so he died quite young. And uh, my aunt Neva uh, 
took, took the business over and ran it until her daughter was a little older, and then they ran it, uh, Arlene and Leon Robertson. I don't know whether anybody remembers them or not. I'm sure somebody here does. I do. <laughs> yeah, but they, they ran the hardware store until 1966 and uh, then sold the business and the building, which I torture Rob over all the time. And I said, your parents were dumb to sell that building. But <laughs> they did. I don't know what they got for it. But uh, it, it existed until 1966. And it was quite a mainstay in, in Rochester. There was Burr Hardware and there was Cases Hardware. And I think those were the two main uh, hardware stores in town for, for, for many years. So you can click that, please. And then this is a business that's kind of near and dear to my heart, obviously, uh, because it's the drugstore, as we refer to it in the family, the drugstore. My, my grandfather graduated from Ferris College. Back then it was Ferris Institute in, in 1910 as a pharmacist. And in 1913, he bought this building, which was originally owned by uh, J.W. Smith, who owned the hotel across the street. Mm -hmm. I don't know why J.W. Smith decided to sell this building that was about 10 years old at the time. Mm -hmm. And my, my grandfather moved his drugstore into this building and was there for a long, long time. Because after he retired, my father took it over. And probably... Mm -hmm. The thing that you mentioned, if I mention the Christian Drug Store, an old timer, the first thing they always want to talk about is the soda fountain. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about the soda fountain is it was a social center probably all through the 30s and 40s, at least that era. And people would come, and the stories are that like during World War II, people would come to the soda fountain and exchange information on guys who were off at the war, trade information. Plus, it became quite a high school hangout, mm -hmm. which my dad didn't particularly appreciate. But uh, there's these guys that go in there and for a dime would hang around for four hours, you know. <laughs> and, and, uh, but it, whatever, it, the, the drugstore became well known as, as, a, as a soda fountain. Plus, they sold liquor there, and they also sold prescriptions. So. The, the drugstore, uh, the drugstore always had a warm place in, in my sister's and mine heart because that's where my dad always was, and uh, that's where we found him. I mean, that's the poor guy worked all the time down there at the drugstore, and my grandfather was there before him. You can click the picture if you want. There, there's an early picture of the inside of the drugstore. I don't know what year that is. That's, that's my grandfather on the right, and I assume that's an employee on the left, although I've never been able to identify exactly who it is. Uh, and so, you can click it again. Here's a little more recent picture, and there's my dad. And my dad's not an old guy there, he's a fairly young man. Uh, and that is somebody, my sister knows who the guy is, the customer. I mean, it's a local guy too. You can't see it in this picture, but up at, up at the top, behind kind of the pipe rack up there, he's got his hours of operation, which at that time were 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. Wow. And, you know, it's no wonder, it, it's no wonder my dad got sick of this, you know. Uh -huh. And my dad became afflicted with, with arthritis later in life, and it, it just got to be too much for him. Uh, the hours, my dad would come home at 6 o'clock for dinner. And man, I'm telling you, if you wanted dinner, you better be there at 6 o'clock because he had one hour. And he wasn't supposed to be out of the drugstore at all because the law says if you have a drugstore that's open, you have to have a pharmacist there. Well, you know, Rochester being Rochester back then, he would, we only lived four blocks away. He'd scoot up home, have dinner, scoot back to the drugstore. So if we wanted to see my dad or talk to him, that was where we went, because by the time he got home, we were already in better. He was too tired to talk anyway. Uh, the drugstore went on for well over 50 years. 
my dad finally sold it in, in 1966. And it was kind of a bittersweet day, I remember that day. And uh, he got a job in a hospital as a pharmacist with much, much less brutal hours, much easier on him. And uh, sold the drugstore to Joe Pinkerton, who operated it for a short time. Then he moved it over to what some of us still call the Pinkerton Building, right. although it's owned by Atala now, and ran his drugstore there. And I, I don't know what became of Joe Pinkerton, but he was here. Well, that would explain that. <laughs> that would explain why I haven't seen him around for a <laughs> But anyway, so the, the drugstore the drug was a, a, a key business in the family. You can uh, click it, if you wouldn't mind. Well, and then, I know you all remember this. In, in 1992, uh, there was a natural gas explosion, which pretty much wiped out the building. We managed to save one-third of the building, where at that time Paula Haig was. And uh, to say that it was a nightmare uh, to go through, it would be an understatement. And there happens to be a fellow in the room here who kind of walked through that process with me. Larry Kanyak, sitting right here, uh, was my attorney. I think I got served with like 25 lawsuits in about a three-week period. Not because I'd done any, we'd done anything wrong, but it was just anybody who got hit by a brick or had damage done. Uh, you know, there was the big net, you know. And uh, I remember talking to Larry early in the game, and I said, Larry, how long is this going to take before it's over? And he said, four years. <laughs> and I said, oh, no, you can't. And you know what? It took four years. <laughs> so, but we did, and, and, and the other person I would like to mention uh, in regards to that little incident was uh, Roy Rewald. Mm. Uh, the morning after the explosion, I called Roy up, and I, I don't think I got two words out of my mouth. I was a little distraught. And Roy said, why don't you come down? And so I went down to his office, and, and Roy, Roy's just a great guy. He said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to rebuild that building. I had no way of knowing what we were going to do, but I said, I want to rebuild it. He said, okay, let's get going. And uh, next thing I knew, Roy's, Roy's out there, and he's cleaning the site up. You know, we got a guy to design the new building, and we started moving forward. And uh, I, one of the reasons Rochester will always be, you know, my hometown is because I saw what the community's like when you're in trouble. And and the community really, really supported us. I mean, they helped us find tenants for the people who didn't have a business anymore, or didn't have an, those were apartments at that time, uh, found, and, and the community really came together, including Roy, who you know, I had to go borrow, we had to go borrow money to complete the, the building, it ran out, and the loan wasn't approved yet. This is typical Roy. I went down to the bank, who I won't mention which bank it is, and I was trying to like, come on, am I going to get this loan or not? You know, and they were him and Han, and they finally said, where's your contract with Roy? We never saw it. And I said, I, I, I don't know. I, don't, I never saw it either. So they called Roy up, and Roy could be very forceful when he wanted to be. And I could hear both sides of the conversation sitting there. And they said, you know, Roy, where's your contract with uh, Chrisman? And he says, contract? He said, you obviously are from around here, are you? <laughs> and the guy says, well, no. And he says, here's how it works. He said, we're going to build a building for John. You're going to loan the money to John. John's going to pay you back the money. We don't need a contract. We don't work on contracts. His word's good. My word's good. You're just going to have to trust this. And you know what? They hung up the phone and gave me the loan. And, and so a lot of us, you know, later on, I, I, I wrote a letter to Roy and tell, told him. And then we, without people like Larry and without people like Roy, this building wouldn't be here today. And it, it's just, uh, I look back at it now and I think it was the worst time of my life and it was the best time of my life too because it came out fine. 
And uh, so we had a nice, nice building down there. And now this is just part of our history. You can uh, click the next one. Now, a lot of people are going to say, grain elevator, what do you have to do with the grain elevator? Well, believe it or not, <laughs> believe it or not, Lewis and Keith Christman owned the grain elevator for 20 years. And uh, my grandfather bought the grain elevator in 1934. Again, I don't know why. Uh, or how that happened. I, I read uh, the actual Rochester Avon Historical Society has a history of the elevator. I've read it. And the elevator changed hands over the years up till the time the Smiths bought it. Many, many, many times. Some of these times, they were owned for like a year by somebody. Then somebody else bought it. Well, in 1934, my grandfather bought it and immediately put Keith down there. Keith was just barely out of high school, started working, and eventually, I don't know, he gave it to Keith or Keith bought it. It became Keith's elevator. And <laughs> Keith and Mary, his wife, uh, ran that elevator, uh, you know, through part of the 30s and all of the 40s. 1954, my uncle, uh, I guess he got tired of the grain elevator, and he had a chance to go in the car business. And uh, so in 1954, he bought the Chevrolet dealership from Ralph Garner mm -hmm. and uh, sold the grain elevator. And, the, and there's Christman Chevrolet. I mean, that is actually an early artist rendering, probably before the building was built, because you can tell the cars are not what you call modern. <laughs> and uh, he was the first one to move the de a dealership from downtown Rochester up on the hill, as we call it. And uh, with the exception of the Dodge dealership, which was on the other hill, uh, you know, Shelton followed shortly after that, and most of them are up there now. But uh, he, he was one of the first ones. He ran the, he owned the Chevrolet dealership from 1954 to 1967. And uh, when he became partners with Ed Wilson, uh, you can click the slide, he became part with Ed Wilson in a Cadillac dealership in Birmingham. And, and I remember talking to him at the time saying, well, I said, you're going to give up 100% ownership of the Chevrolet dealership so you can own half of a Cadillac dealership? And he said, I know what I'm doing, okay? And I said, <laughs> Well, you know, well, I just thought you might want some advice from me, <laughs> but, but he did and, and this is kind of where I get into the picture because uh, shortly after that, uh, I had just gotten out of college and uh, I was home. I was living, still living, I been, been home for two weeks. And my uncle came up to visit my dad. Like I said, everybody was close in the family. And my uncle, who never minced towards, uh, saw me and said, hey, big college boy, are, are you too good to wash cars? And I said, no. He said, do you want to wash cars? I said, yeah, sure, I'll wash cars. I figured, what the heck, I'll buy, I'll pay for beer and gas, right? That's all I cared about back then. As long as I had money for beer and gas, I was okay. So I showed up the very next day and started washing cars, and this was supposed to be just a little temporary thing. And, uh, and true to Crispin form, I never left. And four or five months later, our, our service advisor quit suddenly on him. And I remember him running back and back there washing the car. And he said, Do you know how to write a you know, uh, repair order? I said, I didn't know anything about cars. I said, no, I, I don't know how to do that. He said, well, you're, you're going to learn. And, and he dragged me up there, and I started writing repair orders. I did that for five years. And then as other jobs became open, in the dealership, I, I just was there. It's, there's something to be said for just being there, you know. <laughs> you know, they, you might not be the first choice, but you're handy. You're there. Yeah. So that's how I managed to advance my career was through family opportunity and just hanging around. And uh, Ed Wilson, you know, who was the partners in there. He was an interesting guy, too. His father was Charles Wilson, who was president of General Motors and also the Secretary of Defense. 
And Keith met him at the grain elevator because Ed had a farm in Metamore at that time, kind of a gentleman type farm, and would buy farm supplies from Keith. Well, they became best friends and uh, remained best friends for the rest of their lives. And uh, unfortunately, Mr. Wilson died, I think, in 1978, which case, at that time it was Wilson Christmas Cadillac, then it became Christmas Cadillac, and then Keith passed away in. 1983. By that time, my cousin Chuck was there too with me, and uh, so ch and I bought some of the Chuck's brother and sister's stock out because they had no interest in the dealership, and we became partners in the Cadillac. And uh, then in 1988, we went on to the next venture. We we kept the Cadillac dealership. There was an overlap of a couple of years. And then we back to Rochester because we wanted to come back home and this place was available. So we bought this place and we worked there until we sold it at the beginning of 2012. Actually, Chuck uh, passed away in 2000, 2004. So I was there by myself towards the end. Last few years, uh, it, it wasn't the same without Chuck. Uh, and, and so I sold it back to Ford Motor Company in uh, at the end of 2011, and uh, went home. So <laughs> uh, I decided that was enough. Of, that was a, that was enough of the car business. It was a 40-year career, and it was good enough for me. Uh, you can click the slide here. Does anybody recognize where that is? It's here. That's right here. Yeah. I told you about these. I told you about these epic reunions, and that one slide was an invitation to the 1949 or 45 reunion. And these these reunions involved the Romeo branch, the Oxford branch, the Utica branch, and the Rochester branch, and maybe even the Grand Rapids branch. I have no idea. All I know is this this picture doesn't do it justice because I've seen other photographs where they're all the way across the building. I mean, just, I don't know how they pulled these things off, uh, because they're like high school reunions, you know. But they went on for years, and, and uh, which is part of the reason why the family history is so well documented, because these people kept in touch with one another, and they would do presentations just like this at these reunions, and I have a lot of them. And, uh, since then, I mean, the family just got so big and so spread out that by that time you've got fifth cousins, sixth cousins, they don't even know one another. And at, at some time in the 19, early 1950s, it, it, they, they ceased. So, but I'd like to say that in spite of all the businesses and all the business ventures that the family was involved in, this is really Benjamin Christmas' legacy there. I mean, just just he and his seven children, and right, you know, 180 years later, and I don't know what you you know, you got a problem. We're like cockroaches; we're everywhere. Now. <laughs> <laughs> but at any rate, that 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 concludes my presentation. Uh, I'd be happy to try and answer any questions. Uh, but thanks again for being here. Yeah, I think I comment on the uh, building blowing up. Uh, I was working for Pontiac Motor Division Engineering, and I'm coming home, mm -hmm. and I noticed the guys working out there beside the building. So I go home, and we were going to go ready to fix dinner. I was going to cook on a grill. I heard this hellacious explosion. Yeah, you would hear a well where you live. I was. Yeah. It was right up there on Rewald in Elizabeth, and I heard yeah. that. And I, and I walked out, and I see this big... Cloud of smoke. Yeah. I said, oh my God! It sounded like a 500 pound bomb going off. Yeah. So we walked out there, and I could not believe. And hear me without a camera. Yeah, I know. I, I I've often thought, you know, because over the well, that was 1992, 20 some years ago now. It's hard to believe, but I've often thought I'd like to write a book about everybody's story because I've had. Literally dozens and dozens of people tell me 
where they were when it happened, you know, and they all have very distinct memories of it. I do too, obviously, and it'd make a fun book to read, you know, to, to write. If you go to the uh, fire hall today, they have a giant picture on them of, of the collapsed building. And uh, I, I tell you, though, the, the, it was an amazing thing, and the firemen and uh, Bill Gray and, and just the people that, I mean, really risked life and limb because we didn't know at that point uh, how many people, we obviously one poor soul died. That's the guy that got everybody out of the building. But that's the guy that got out of the, and he was a hero. Yeah. But we didn't know how many people inside there were that, that had been killed. Yeah. And so they had dogs down there. And I, you remember the crowd that was down there? It was down yeah. there all night. I was down there all night long. And every now and then I would find it because we had all these college kids living upstairs. And How I would, many apartments were upstairs? Five. Wasn't there one a cook? They were not luxury apartments. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, wasn't there a cook that worked for Naps that worked up in there? Yeah, his name was Davis Cannon. He couldn't take it. Yeah, that was another sad story. But anyway, uh, I remember watching Penny walk up the street. Her face was just like this, white. Well, I was a little white too, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, but, but yeah, that, that, was, that, was a, that was an epic moment. John, yes. I live on the McGregor Farm, Great Oaks Boulevard. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I was in my kitchen, and I heard the the sound. Oh, I'm you sure. You were deaf. Uh -huh. I, 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 I mean, yes, up? yeah. My husband was born in that building in 1910. Really? When Oscar Price owned the building. Oscar Price. Well, I think his name was Oscar Price. Yeah. I, I, yeah, your great grandfather or right. something. You anyway, mean, you mean you were involved in that building too? Uh oh. And Don, <laughs> can't get away from me, John. Guess not. Well, Don's father <laughs> ran the movie. They, they showed movies upstairs there, in one of the kind rooms. Of. You mean like a theater? Yeah. Well, yeah, they had a the little theater, all, all yeah. The theater. And he ran the picture machine. And I think they had to do it by hand. I don't know for sure how they did it. <laughs> I had no idea. Well, he would wait until there was a good crowd there before he'd start the movie. Well, one night he waited too long and Don's father walked out. <laughs> but he paid his rent by running the picture machine. Well, that's an interesting story. <laughs> then it, during the war, Mary Jean Myers um, was marrying Ron Myers and he came home to get married, but they didn't have anybody to stand up with him because the guy that was supposed to be the best man couldn't get leave. So they went down to Christmas and asked who's home. Yeah. No, well, that's like I said, it was a clearinghouse of information. Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 And that was the way they got the best man from the way. Well, I wonder if my grandfather charged for that. <laughs> I would hope so. All right. Anybody? Oh, yes. Um, I, I'm sorry. Which Christmas was your father? Ken. Kenneth. Uh, my family, uh, and, and uh, my wife and I moved here with our kids about 42 years ago, so we're newcomers. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It'll take time. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you had a sister or cousin who was um, uh, pretty active in politics. Held some Penny. 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 Penny, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Penny, my, my cousin Chuck was married to Penny. And Penny, Penny's still in town. She's still around. I know she hasn't died. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, when I say cousins and things like Chuck and I were more like brothers than cousins because we were together every day for over 30 years. And That's what's been so attractive about this area yeah. to, to our family. Yeah. And now our, our son is, has uh, two boys. Yeah. And, and, uh, they moved away, but they moved back. Yeah, smart. You know, he went to Oakland University. Yeah. And uh, as a matter of fact, he sold some advertising to you. Uh, when he got out of school at Oakland, things were really bad economically. Now, this is a smart kid. I'm not saying that because he's my son. To God be the glory. But uh, he, he managed to get a, 
a job working for the Clarion oh, sure. newspaper, yeah. and he visited you and other businesses around town. Uh -huh. One day, he, for everybody that's here who doesn't know John, um, he's a good man. <laughs> All right? Absolutely. And I say that because my son came home one day after t trying to sell ads for the Clarion, and uh, yeah, he said, uh, we were just sitting down at dinner, uh, Carol always made a, a nice dinner every day for the, for the kids and myself. And uh, he and we said, well, how'd it go today, Paul? And he said, well, the outstanding part of my day was I met John Crispin. <laughs> and he said, he said, he was really good to me. He said, you know, he was very respectful. And Paul had, my son <clears throat> had had some <clears throat> unfortunate meetings with other, some other businessmen in town and said, felt like, oh, this is just some whippersnapper, you know. Uh, I have business to take care of. When, when, when he saw John, it was altogether different. He, respect, he, he, showed, he showed my son Paul that it, uh, he respected him as a, a young man who had a bright future and showed him much, much respect. You know, I imagine it went something like this, from what I heard at the dinner table then. That, oh, come on in my office and, and uh, we'll talk about it. And uh, right then he, uh, he knew that, uh, you know, and uh, by the way, Paul rewrote your ad. Well, probably needed rewriting. <laughs> so I say that it wasn't just me being nice. He helped me too. I share. But anyway. Now might be living by that peach farm because he's off at 28 and Mount. There he's back my old home yeah. town. Yeah, my old, old area. But no, Rochester, I mean, you, you'll never... Rochester is our hometown, you know. I know everybody here feels that way. Uh, I, I consider myself very fortunate to have been raised here, and uh, it, it would take, well, they tried to blow me out of here with dynamite. <laughs> <laughs> and that didn't work. But I, I also have some schoolmates here, you know, and that's part of the fun of being, staying in the same spot, is yeah. seeing old friends, that mm -hmm. some things just continue on. I'm not a big one for change, so anyway, <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah.